Hello, and welcome to Sobercast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting Sobercast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. I'm here tonight by the grace of God and the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous. And, uh, you know, uh, anybody who struggles with the miracles, uh, I can assure you I'm one of them. Uh, I, I'm i an alcoholic of that kind who shouldn't be here. You know, I, um, you know, I lived a very dangerous life prior to coming to Alcoholics Anonymous. And, uh it was, it was, um, you know, it was, uh, it was a, a roller coaster of a raid until uh, uh, I finally got to to the rooms. Um, as I say, my name is Richard, and uh, I, I'm really pleased to be here. There's a few faces uh, uh, that I, I I actually know. Uh, I'm living in Southwest France at the moment. Uh, uh, I'm here, uh, and I'm renovating a very old farmhouse, um, which is hard work, but I'm really enjoying it. And uh, I had a friend today uh, who came uh, yesterday and stayed, uh, and we had a great, great time together. It was lovely to see him in in in, in 3D because we've only met him in uh, on Zoom. And um, it's funny when you meet another alcoholic, how easy it is, as if you know, I've known that person for, 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 for a lifetime. Uh, there's just something clicks. Uh, and, and that's, that's how I've always felt uh, in Alcoholics Anonymous. That's the true identification. You don't, you don't have to try. You just fall into a conversation with another alcoholic. Um, and, that, and that's, that's, that's you know, uh, again, something that is, I, I became aware of very early on in AA. But um, I'll start at the beginning. I'll start, uh, I was born in Northern Ireland. Uh, in the early fifties, and uh, I, uh, uh, I had the, the the first few years of my relationship was uh, was 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 uh, my 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 life with my family. My father and mother were was was very good, and um, I, I had loving loving parents, and uh, I, I you know and 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 a very loving grandmother that. Uh, uh, was which was which which uh, you know I loved her dearly, um, but when I, when I was sort of six six and a half, my now my father was everything to me. He was really upstanding man. Um, he he had uh, he 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 became ill, um, in a, in, a, in in so much as that he started to have these convulsions, which turned out to be. In the end, a brain tumor, but I didn't know any of that, and um, and and uh, he deteriorated uh, till his death over the next three years, and uh, and and it was a major trauma for me. Uh, that was that was really kind of from seeing this, you know, this man who was my my mentor, my my sort of hero, as he, as as your father, at least for me, my father was, um, and and. D- deteriorate from 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 a from a healthy strong uh man to to just a a a, a, a shell and a bed uh that i felt rather ashamed about which was the first time i ever experienced shame in 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 the truest sense i don't know why i was ashamed i just felt that that um that he had become uh, you know, where he couldn't talk, walk, or feed himself, you know, and to me that just seemed like he had let me down. Um, so you know that 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 was that was that was my kicker for into 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 life. I I never blame anything for my alcoholism. I believe my alcoholism was in me. It's just I just it was there anyhow. And, and my and I you know I I had my first. I mean, even when I was. In the in the early days of my life, I always wondered if perhaps my mum had brought the wrong kid home from from the hospital. You know, there was an attachment in me. I could never get to the bottom of it. I didn't understand it. Um, it was there, and 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 you know, I used to spend a lot of time in other people's houses um, that, rather than my own. Um, then it became that way, um, and I. 
I was unsettled. I was very unsettled. Uh, I had my first drink uh, after my father's funeral. Um, I was nine years of age, and uh, and 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 uh, someone made me uh, a whiskey, hot whiskey, and 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 they put they put uh, uh, water and sugar in it to to to, to uh, and give it to me, and um, I remember drinking this. And I remember really to this day, I'll never forget that warm feeling that came up from inside me. And it just made me feel different, you know. It just made me, you know. And I knew from that day, that day I was drink. I didn't actually carry on drinking from, from nine years of age. But at 13, I picked up my first serious drink. And and of course, like I've heard so many times over over the last last forty plus years, um, I come in. My sobriety date is 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 the twenty second of October nineteen seventy eight. So I've heard a lot of a lot of speakers. I've heard a lot of people talk about their this illness. I've heard many theories. Personally, I like to stick to the black bits. It's the white bits that are confusing. That's in the big book. Um, you know, and, and, and that has been, uh, you know, that's, that's, so I've had it most of my life in this fellowship, really, you know, I've had the better, the better part of it in Alcoholics Anonymous. And, um, you know, so that, 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 you know, my, my life that prior to Alcoholics Anonymous, as I said at the beginning was, 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 was a train wreck because it was always going it was always going off the rails. And when did it come off the rails? Probably from that, you know, from that, from, from I was 13 when I took, and the first time I drank, I blacked out. And and so that, you know, I had no, no idea what had happened. I just felt ill. But did that stop me taking another drink? Not a chance. I look, I actually look forward to the next drink, you know. And at that time in Northern Ireland, was in the uh, mid sixties, so you know. So there was a lot of stuff happening in Northern Ireland. A lot of serious stuff was happening. Uh, people were getting really kind of geared up for 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 a big fight and a big row. You know, people were splitting down the middle. People stopped talking to each other, and and I, I, I you know, I'd become employed by a, a Catholic, I'm a Protestant, I became employed by a Catholic company and um, I was really happy working for, for this this company. Uh, I had an apprenticeship and, and, and what have you. And I was, I was in a, a, a cafe in our town having a cup of coffee and my a cousin and another uh, a fella that I knew came in and just made himself welcome at the table. Like, you know, how are you doing? I, yeah, I didn't know what was coming. And, you know, and they suggested strongly that I should leave uh, this this firm, you know, based on the fact that they were, you know, I was a Protestant and they were a Catholic. And, and really meant that, by the way. That wasn't said in, in sort of some casual way. This was a serious, serious threat. Uh, and I didn't agree. Um, and then and again, that 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 was another trait of mine. I was quite, um, I wasn't, I I couldn't tolerate bullying. I'd had had I'd had some experience of bullying, and 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 I'd reacted against it um, in 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 a quite angry and violent way. Uh, so I didn't like this attitude they were they were coming across. But the problem was at that time. It was more than attitude. There was there was uh, weapons and arms being traded, and all sorts was happening. So it wasn't idle in that matter. And and at that time, nobody had been shot, but the threat of being being maybe maybe hurt or or kneecapped was was certainly on the on the agenda. So I I remember t- talking to an uncle of mine and asking him, and he 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 said to me, because of your attitude, he said, I suggest you do pack up and leave and go. To, to to England and uh, and I thought about it and, and and I did I went to my employer and I told them what had happened and they they thought that that was a good idea because they didn't want to bring flack to the to, to, to their company and all that sort of stuff so I I up and left England 
and I I came and I, it it was like I was I was free of family and and, and family uh, ties and free of everything. I just came on my own, and um, and really, I, I, you know, I was a bit of a lost boy, really. And you know, of course, alcohol and drugs were it was the it was this, it was still the sixty late sixties. It was you know everything was happening, and. Um, I got a good job. I was working, and I I came up to I was wor- working outside of London. I came up to London for a weekend, met some friends that I'd met from Northern Ireland in 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 London, and uh, and 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 they said um, uh, they were they they were all dressed really well and doing it. And I said, "What what are you guys doing?" And they said, "Oh, we're we're selling we're selling pills." And I said to him, oh, really? <laughs> you know, yeah, that's the, you know, and, and there's loads of money to be made and blah, blah, blah. So, of course, with a few drinks of me, I said, I want to know more. So the, the following weekend, I, I, I was back again and, um, you know, and they gave me these these pills. They were it was amphetamines, and I went to 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 this this bar that was all action bar, and and I sold all these amphetamines in 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 sort of you know an evening, um, and made more money than I'd made all week working my you know myself to death. And I thought this is this is where this is the easier, softer way. You see, <laughs> I'll go for that. You know, and four years later, um. I'm an international drug smuggler. Now, how does that happen? But only to an alcoholic, you know. I mean, I was, it was, you know, I was running stuff across borders, Morocco, and then, and then from further afield back to the UK, America, Canada, the whole shebang. You know, it was, it was serious shit, and, um, and, and of course, the inevitable happened. You know, the, the, as, as it does. And all that time I was doing that, I remember I was in a situation, you know, alcohol and other substances were were obviously becoming more and more uh, uh, apparent. And my abuse of alcohol was, had, had now become, you know, where oh, I wasn't I continually drunk. I was far from drinking every day. I wasn't, you know, but I was, I was, when I drank, I drank seriously heavily and usually blacked out and there was a lot of stuff. But I also drank because of fear, because though I, I, I you know, this what I was doing and the, the people I was doing it with, um, I had the bravado uh, because I knew that there was something in me that wasn't, completely i mean i wasn't i was the money was i mean it was it, the cash and all the trappings of that great but i still felt uncomfortable and said about like you know the consequences and as such but never really thinking about the true consequences just consequences you know that if you get caught i'm going to be in trouble and um and i i i i basically you know um uh drank uh, just to keep myself together. I remember coming back from Morocco, uh, driving, you know, driving across the border into Algiers, you know, to Algiers and Spain, and, and and you know, we were we were driving Land Rovers and and stuff that was really, uh, you know, and this dockyard was full of ripped apart vehicles and torn apart, and people were getting twenty years in jail in Spain and stuff like that, you know, so. I I I figured I needed a drink, you know. So I, most of the time, I'd be sitting there in in, in the cab. I'd be pissed. I'd be absolutely pissed. Where everybody else was, you know, I I had that. Maybe that was the reason, you know, that they said, "Well, it's you know, maybe he's you know, he doesn't seem like a drug smuggler, but I was." And then it moved on to other things, and I got I, I the you know, and then the British Customs and Excise. Um, I got involved unbeknown to myself and others, and I was arrested um, uh, for, 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 for part, part of one part of this and followed by uh, all sorts of conspiracies for, for other stuff. So I, I, I'm now in serious trouble and I'm, sort of, uh, I'm, I'm 20 years age, you know, and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm charged with all sorts of 
offences. Um, so I, I, it was serious. We, you know, um, there was large amounts, uh, you know, where they had to. We, I was uh, one of the biggest courts in the UK is the Old Bailey in London, and that's where our case was. And um, when when we were, we were the they, they exhibits. Uh, that they had found, which was almost half a ton of cannabis. Uh, they were bringing them into the courtroom in 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 supermarket trolleys or that type of thing, you know, to, as exhibit one <laughs> for the for the jury. And um, the trial, uh, you know, the trial went on for wait anyway. Um, you know, the, the hammer fell and I, I, I was sent to prison. Uh, and what I didn't realise is the nature of my of what we were doing was seen to be, uh, they made me a Category A prisoner. So, uh, you know, I'm now in a Category A prison. I have never been to, to prison. I had no, uh, you know, I, I just, you know, I'd been in lots of police cells, you know, I'd been in different things like that for, for, for just being drunk or disorderly or maybe or whatever but not not in prison and uh i didn't know what to do i was i was really alarmed by the whole situation there was a lot of people heavy people duty people in there um who were you know uh and who had spent most of their life going through the system uh to get there i was a i was a newcomer i mean that was a big experience uh for me um and and I'd been sentenced to 17 years in in prison uh you know and that that uh, that was appealed and and it was reduced to five years in prison uh I, I say that off the top of your tongue but five years in any institution which is like three then it was three and a half years to to, to serve um it was a long time and um and I I I, I you know but you see, in in many ways, I I uh, you know um, I got through that by the same way as I got into myself into into situations. I I I got myself you know just I got through it by by bravado by bullshit by any you know I just got through it. Um, and yet the day I got out of that prison, I hadn't had a drink or any substance for three and a half years, and they give. I decided to catch a train from from the station back to London, and it was as soon as the train pulled in, I saw there was a a, a buffy car on the um, on the train, and um, I went there and I bought three or or four I can't remember uh, uh, miniature bottles of brandy. I bought, bought a first class ticket to get in this train, and uh, I went and sat in the first first class carriage I could see. And they were all businessmen. And I'm sitting there and I, I you know, I you know, I didn't look, you know, I'm pasty, I haven't seen the sun much of the sun. I'm looking, you know, they probably knew because it was the station, probably plenty of prisoners got on there. I did. And this guy suggested I show him my ticket to prove that I had a first class ticket which I said was not going to happen, followed by drinking the, the brandy, followed by another brandy, followed by another brandy. And then, you know, and they got really upset and they, they got the guard to, to come to look at... And, you know, I I didn't give a flying F, really. You know, these guys, I had to take them and, and I had every right to be there. And that sort of belligerence and that sort of, you know, uh, I, I, I picked up this attitude. Yet... That was part of 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 some of the stuff that, I, that we all have to deal with uh, when we get here. And I got off this uh, the train in London, pissed. Uh, you know, I went and got more brandy. I was drunk. So you know, it it just shows you this is a progressive illness. You know, whether you're drinking or not drinking. And I just picked it up again three and a half years later, and just and, and just started again. You know, that was 1975. And that was the real decline then, the beginning of the real decline from 75 through to 78. And that's when I say I shouldn't be here. Um, and I'll just give you an incident of, of why, uh, you, you know, how alcoholics can get themselves into situations that are highly dangerous and in and, 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 and a blackout and, and then not actually, you know, 
one of the things I thought about black is when you were comatose. I never knew to came to a that a black is you're walking, talking, but nobody's at home. You know, the lights are on, but there's nobody there. But you're making arrangements. You're doing this. You're doing that. And I was, I went after I came out of, out of prison about two months later. A, a friend of mine who lived in Belfast. Now Belfast in 1975, let me tell you, was not a place you wanted to be. There was a lot happening and a lot of things were going on. And um, I went home and he lived in Sandy Row. Now Sandy Row is a place, uh, is, a, is a Protestant enclave uh, in, in, in Belfast. And I went to see him there and we went for a drink. I came round in a pub and I was singing Protestant songs because I thought I was still in this Protestant in, in, in the pub that I'd started off in. But I wasn't. I was in a, another pub in a Catholic enclave in a very dangerous situation. And that is what, what happens to me when I take a drink. <laughs> so, and not just, you know, so I'm now in, a, in, you know, coming out of this blackout, and this guy's right in my face, and not just stunned with his face, he's got a revolver, and it's, it's at the side of my temple, and he's saying to me, you effing prod bastard. Uh, you, you know, and I, I, I'm coming, try, I'm sobering up pretty quickly because of the situation, you see, I never, I could never see the consequences of what drink was taking me into. Because once I took a drink, I never knew what was going to happen. Now, that was just how it was. That was danger. That's how dangerous alcohol is. And, and when I put, I put it into my system. And by a stroke of luck, and it's God, this is the first time I know, not just the first time because it happened before, but I wasn't aware or, or really connected the two things, but only since I came to AA. God was looking after me because I was going to get either shot in the head because there was all sorts of people being found in alleyways at the time, or I was going to get kneecapped. And, you know, that, that I, you know, and I could do nothing about it. I was, there was four people there that were really kind of, uh, you know, looking at me and not, they, they, you know, it was a serious situation. And as they were taking me out of the bar, uh, the door opened and a man walked in who I knew and I drank with in London a few years before that. And him and I had become quite good friends. But he had now gone back to join the cause. And he was a very high, he was one of the commanders in the RA. And, I, and he just looked at me. And here's the thing about the alcoholic. He looked at me and he looked at them and he, and he said to me, what are you, what are you doing here? And I, and I said his name and I said, I'm, I'm, I'm pissed. And he looked at these guys and he said, I'll deal with him. He's, he's an alcoholic. And in my head, I went, how dare, how dare. <laughs> One minute before this, I'm, I'm in, I don't know what's going to happen to me. And he's nice calling me an alcoholic. And in my head, I'm going, that's not very, that's not very nice. You're my friend. Why are you calling me an alcoholic for? In my head. And he took me out and he, he put me in a black cab and he said, now I'll tell, give you a bit of advice. And uh, this is the last chance for you. He said, you know, you go back to where you came from in England, but get out of Belfast tomorrow. First plane, get out. And I, actually took his advice because you don't have a trauma like that and then not, you know, regardless of what you're like, but uh, alcohol took me, that was one of the situations and many other situations in between then till I got in 1978 uh, when I finally fell through the door of Alcoholics Anonymous. It was a mad, mad time and I was a really just lost, lost as I, I had a grown up body and an emotional, emotional, uh, um, you know, uh, experience in, in dealing with stuff in life. I was like a 12 year old. I hadn't, I hadn't really moved on. I hadn't really, you know, dealt with life and life's terms. I'd none of that. I just drank and every, or took some, some substance to get me through whatever the issue was, whatever the situation was, you know, and, uh, you know, so it was, um, it was a strange day that I came to Alcoholics Anonymous because I, um, 
I'd been to see a doctor. Uh, I went to see a doctor. That it, it, he was uh, a lot of alcoholics used to go to this doctor uh, because he would prescribe all sorts of stuff for you. Uh, you know, uppers, downers, anything you wanted. Uh, and he'd just write prescriptions and he'd repeat them. So you didn't have to go back to see him. You just went to the to, to the chemist or the doctor, got your pre- prescription and then got it filled and away you went. And um, and that was, that was, you know, that was what I was, that was one of the things I was doing. Um, and I went into the, the, to, to the doctor's surgery and the receptionist and asked for me my um prescription. And the, the receptionist she looked at me, she said, Oh, the doctor wants to see you. And as soon as they and I thought, the doctor wants to see me. And I asked, I said, Why? She said, Well, obviously you're not well. You're here and the doctor, you can, you know, getting prescribed drugs and what have you. Mm-hmm. And I went into a complete panic attack. I went, whoa, 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 you know. So I sat there on my hands, because now I'm real, I'm in fear. I thought, well, no, what am I going to do? And I went into the surgery, and a new doctor was sitting there. And, and he, he, you know, he's got my file in front of him, and he's leafing through it. And he just looked up over his glasses, wearing them little, little glasses on the point of his nose. And he looked at him and he said, this is all going to stop. And I went, what? He said, this is not going to continue. He said, you don't, you've got to tell me what's the matter with you. I, I don't, you know, what is the truth? And I, to this day, why did I say to him, I've got a drink problem? I didn't ever say to anybody, I've got a drink problem. You know, I, you know, I was called many things, uh, you know, piss artist, alcoholic, this, that, and the other. But nobody ever used the term drink problem. And I'm saying to this doctor, I've got a drink problem. And where did that come from? And he, you know, and he said, all oh, right, okay. And he opened the drawer, and I don't know what I thought. He, I thought he took sympathy on me. And he opened the drawer, and he took out the card that someone in this fellowship had made time in service to go and put the cards into the doctor's surgery. And he said to me, here's the card. These people will help you. It wasn't a, there was no more of, you know, blah de blah blah because I think it, it was just the simplicity of it. And I took the card and he, you know, and he wrote me a prescription for just the, the silliest of stuff. And I, I went, oh, okay. And I wandered out there in the days, but I had this card in my hand. And I went home and the only reason uh, that I, there was a telephone on was like usual was the, my girlfriend at the time was, had, had uh, you know, had, had paid the bill. I wouldn't have paid the bill. So, I made the call, and in that process, my selective hearing was my life, was my saviour, because I thought, when I spoke to the lady, she said to me, I thought she said, there's a clinic this evening. A clinic? That sounded good to me. Yes, medication, uh, somebody to, to, to talk to, they'll give me medication. She said, but if you can manage to stay sober... Uh, stay not have a drink. She didn't say that. She just said not have a drink till this evening. It's um, I, I tell. Do you want? Oh, she did ask me. Did I want somebody coming to us? I said no. I'll find my way. Where is it? She said it's in Telgarth Road. I'm on Telgarth Road. She said, yeah. Do you know it? I said, oh, I do know it very well. And the reason I knew it was, it was where a heroin dealer lived. And at the same time as I was drinking at that point, I was actually using heroin on and off. Not, I'd actually used it a lot more, but I was now just using it when I was, you know, was using it. But I'd gone to this heroin dealer's house about three weeks before, and his criteria for for getting your gear in his house was that you didn't shoot up in his house. No way, Jose, were you to shoot up. And I said to him, can I use your bathroom? And he said to me, don't you dare shoot up my bathroom. And, of course, I went in the bathroom, shot up the gear far too much and went down. And came to when somebody was dragging me out of basement steps about six uh, houses away from his. He just took me out of the premises and set me down these basement steps and and just left me there. 
they did. He wasn't going to bring a heat to him, and I, and my life wasn't worth a carrot. Didn't care, <laughs> and it was six doors away from the meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. Now, how about that for an irony? You know. And anyway, I marched into this meeting. It was five to five to seven. And I thought, yeah. And these people, but I opened the door, and there was all sorts of people laughing. Smelling, and a guy came up and he said, oh, "Hi, Dan. What's your name?" And I said, uh, "Richard." He said, "Do you want a cup of tea?" I couldn't have held a cup of tea. I said, "No, mate. I don't want a cup of tea." I thought, you know, and and I'm looking around the room and I'm thinking, "I've missed the I've missed the medication," but I sat through the meeting and funnily enough, I met a man at the 75th anniversary of Alcoholics Anonymous in in UK. Um, there he was at my first meeting and he was sitting by a piano and a lovely man called Jim. And, um, uh, you know, he was, he was, he, you know, uh, I love him dearly. Really, really nice person. Um, but I sat through that meeting thinking, I know that behind those double doors that are split in this room, there's obviously the medication. And when this, me- this, whatever's happening here, because I'm looking at the, the bait, I'm looking at the, the the table and it's got the serenity prayer in Gothic script. It's, I'm looking at the steps in the wall and I'm thinking, God, 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 God. I had no, I had no, I had no God. God was not in my life, nothing to do with God. I, you know, it was not happening. I thought, well, I'll just wait for the medication. And the meeting finished. And there's a Scots guy sitting beside me and he said, how are you? And I said, well, I might be all right after I get the medication. And he said, he said to me, medication. He said, is it drink you're here? For? Are you, you know, is it, you know, are you, are you, are you, you know, is it drink, drink problem, drink what, drink whatever? And I said, yeah, uh, that is that. Yeah, I'm here because obviously it's an alcoholics anonymous meeting. He said, well, I'll, t- I'll tell you something. I'll tell you a secret. He said, you need never drink again. I couldn't believe this, man. Do you know that simple sentence got through my stupid, thick head? And it, it was just, you need never drink again. Believe me, what had ha- was happening to me prior to coming to that meeting was was just insanity, you know, in between my ears. And here's a man telling me, I need never drink again. And he said to me, where, where do you live? And I told him, I live in Shepherd's Bush. And I, he said, how did you get here? I said, I came up in the, tra- in, the, in the tube, London Underground. He said, oh, I lived down there. He didn't. He had a car. And he, was, he lived in another part. He lived in Kensington. And he said to me, I'm going back that way. But what he was doing was 12-stepping me. And this guy came on the train, and we caught the train, at Barnes Court, and we went to Hammersmith, we changed on the Metropolitan Lane, we got on the and when we got down the steps into Goldhawk Road where I was living, I turned on him because and I poked him in the chest and I said, How the F do you know so much about me? And he looked at me in the eye and he said, I haven't been talking about you, boy. He said, That's my experience with alcohol. The first time I ever identified with another with another alcoholic, and believe me, he knocked it. He 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 was he 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 everything that I wasn't saying, he was saying, and he was quite happy to share with me about his fear of not being able to go to, to sleep with the light on, uh, with, unless the light was on. Uh, you know, wet in the bed, doing all sorts of stuff. He didn't talk like to anybody in the bar about that. No, 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 no. You you know that you were the big brave mouse uh but at night time and the and the shadow men came and and the people that were you know the terrors and the sweats and the whole bit none of that was you you were you know jack and everything was fine and this guy broke through my armor he broke through my armor and uh and i and he and, and i've never taken another drink from that day because for the next three weeks four weeks he came got me 
took me to meetings, took me all sorts of places in my area in West London, and then, you know, um, took me to meetings just outside the area, what have you. And, uh, and one night he said to me, uh, I, 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 I rang him up. There was no mobile phones then. I just rang him up and I said, are you going to the Friday night meeting at Brook Green? And he said, yeah, I'll be there. I'll see you. So I went to Brook Green. And no sign of Joe. I was, I was all through the meeting. I'm thinking, well, he, he said he'd be here. And I was all, all of a meeting finished. Went and made a phone call to him. I said, Joe, you didn't come to the meeting. He said, were you there? I went, of course I was there because you. He said, well, that's the best. That's good. Crack on. And Joe was a man who 12-step people. He wasn't a long-term sponsor. And, he, you know, he told me, just get on me and find a sponsor and, and, and do all that stuff. But, but he, he gave me four weeks of his, his daily attention to, to get me sorted and get me going to meetings and then let me get on with it. And that was how it was then. I think a lot of people, um, you know, got, got that initial help. And then, you know, when you sobered up, because let's face it, after four weeks, you know, it's not alcohol is a problem. It's, your, it's what's in your head because, you know, uh, you're not physically addicted after four weeks the alcohol it's just in your head you're addicted you know um and 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 as an alcoholic i i, I kind of got that uh, but but my determination was i was uh, you know this this was a new way of life and um and there i was in alcoholics anonymous meeting all sorts of people uh you know and it was exciting and it was new and you know my life started to open up um my girlfriend prior to AA, we, 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 you know, we, we got married. We had two children. Uh, one of them is in the room tonight, bless her heart. Um, uh, and, and, and my son, uh, you know, uh, the, the, and I got a business and, you know, we, we things were, 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 uh, you know, opening up all, all over the place, all God given, but I just thought it was because I, I stopped drinking because really, this is the, the the you know the theme of the meeting tonight, which um, I wanted to be, um, which I'd said, contempt prior to investigation, which is my favourite line in the big book. But it was suggested that um, that I I that the the theme tonight, which is which is fine and I get it, which was all the reactions to life, uh, but but the 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 whole. The whole concept of 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 this uh, this evening's meeting is for me to talk about the the you know the, the quote um, and I'm sure plenty of plenty of you have heard it, um, which is uh, it, it, it started off this this actually this quote which is uh, there is a principle in recovery. There is a principle which is a bar against all information, which is proof against all argument, and which cannot fail to keep man's man or woman in everlasting ignorance. That principle is contempt prior to investigation. And basically, that's what that means for me is, you know, just means having the conclusion for something before you have all the facts. And that was me to a T. Because, you see, I didn't want... Change was difficult. Fear was... It was everything, you know, everything in my life was fear-based. So everything was bravado. So it was usually contemptuous against anything that might help me, you know, or might change me. So, you know, that, that, was, that, was, that was the reason for it. But, but the strange thing about contempt prior to investigation, it, it, it was mentioned... Very early in 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 the um, in the edition one of our big book, and then they dropped it, and then they brought it back, and and it it, it became uh, you know the 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 um you know the the spiritual experience, and it it's it's in the big book, but it's if it's uh, it's it's obviously plagiarized from 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 the guy who wrote it, but it's at the at the end of 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 uh, of, of of that it originally appeared in three page three thirty of the of the of the first edition, um, but it's in there, and it is about altered reactions to life. It, it sure, the two things are the same because until I was able to see that I 
It was me was the problem. I was the one that had to change. Not you, not late, you know, my job, not this, not that. I was the one that had to change. And that didn't come easily to me. And I spent some years in Alcoholics Anonymous fighting the very fact that there was God in the big book. I went to atheist meetings in London. I went to them till one day I realized as I was going to these meetings that I wasn't like them because these people really believed there was no God and I wasn't sure. So then I transferred after some time, I was starting to go to the agnostics meetings. And it was great because we spent more time in the agnostics meeting talking about God than we did in any other meeting, you know. So there we were all huddled together talking about, you know, how we didn't believe, how we did it, blah, 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 blah. And, 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 I, But I would not surrender. I would not surrender to the fact that I needed a spiritual experience for me to recover. You know, that bit where it's a, you know, profound spiritual experience, I wasn't having it. Because I thought that if I got a nice few quid, a nice house, two children, nice business, this, that and the other, that would fix me. The answer to that was, oh, <laughs> the result was nil. <laughs> Until you let go, absolutely, the result was nil. So I've tried always to fix me prior to actually taking the easy, this easy step, which is to come to believe, you know. And 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 it was all based on contempt. You know, that wasn't new new to me because I I could look at any situation, I could look at a human being and come up with the assumption that they were this, they were that. I didn't even know them. They just walked through the bar, into the bar. And I'd say to somebody, he's not right. And they'd look at me and say, what do you mean he's not right? And I'd say, oh, I know he's, he's just, he's, he's not, you know, he's not right. And that, I, what was that about? I mean, you know, so all this stuff that I carried, all this misconceptions, alive misconceptions, of this mis I brought them all to the table in Alcoholics Anonymous. And people used to say, maybe, Richard, if you take the cotton wool out of your ears, put it in your mouth and listen, it would be easier for you. And I'd say, oh, some come see, come. I'll be all right, I'm fine. But inside, after a few years in Alcoholics Anonymous, I felt a fraud because I was talking the talk but not walking the walk. So I was talking about doing the steps. I was talking about the sponsor. I was talking about all these things, but I wasn't doing it. You know, I wasn't actually feeling happy. In fact, I was becoming really lonely. And then it become, uh, that isolation started to creep in to sitting in the rooms. And I'd be going to the meeting, and the meeting, at like an hour and a half, I thought, this is a lifetime. This is a lifetime. And I'd have to put give somebody a couple of quid and say, put that in the pot, I've got something to do. And I had nothing to do. I just couldn't sit in the meeting because I felt fraudulent. And I, and the strange thing was, it wasn't a drink, at least not on the surface. It, 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 I just wanted an, an escape. I just wanted a way again. I'm looking for... So I'm now transferring things to doing other things, you know, you know to, to, to change it. You know, I didn't gamble. Suddenly I'm gambling. Right, I didn't go. I didn't go to brothels. Suddenly, I'm going to brothels. I mean, I'm I'm doing everything to change. I'm having affairs. I'm doing all sorts of stuff to change the way I felt. And all I had to do was surrender and ask for help. And I couldn't. This is a powerful illness, powerful, bigger than me, bigger than any of us here in this room today. If I don't deal with it, it'll kill me. No question. And that doesn't, I don't care how long you're an alcoholic synonymous, I can still, you know, it, it, it's a dangerous, dangerous game if you become complacent. There's no complacency with this disease. You know, if you prioritize your life away from alcoholics synonymous, you will end up like I've seen so many people. They, they don't come back and tell you it's got better. They come back to tell you it's got worse if they get back.
if they get back, you know. And I was one of those people who was on the verge. But my decision wasn't to drink. My decision after several years in Alcoholics Anonymous with two children, a business, a home, a wife, all that, was that I would actually kill myself because I had no programme in my life. I had stopped drinking. And I tried to actually take my life by using uh, other, uh, another substance, heroin, and because I'd used it before, I'd bought more that would enough to kill an elephant, and I went to do it in, in, at the back of a, a place that I'd spent many nights laughing with AA members. I sat in a car at the side of the River Thames down in Hammersmith, and I wanted to take my own life by just plunging this stuff into my arm. Now, that's not an option I want anybody in this room to get to. But I, for me, know the reasons I got to that, because I had no program in my life. Mm -hmm. I had no spiritual experience going on in my life. I had nothing changing, you know. And I became more and more uh, in fear, paranoia. And I, again... God sends intervention. I was in a, a builder's merchants. Uh, I hadn't paid the, my, my account. And one of the staff asked me in front of the, a couple other people in the shop uh, if I would uh, sort out my, my account. And I flipped. How dare he ask for his money? How dare he come out and ask me like this? You know, blah, 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 blah. And we had a big argument. And I walked out uh, to, to get into my truck and uh, I met an AA member. And here's the strange thing about it. And I hadn't been going to meetings at this stage. He said to me, oh, hi, Richard. How are you doing? I didn't like this man. But why did he come that day? Why did he pass by while I was coming out in a state of flux and madness again? He said to me, Oh, I haven't seen you in the rooms. Oh, I've been busy. I've been this, I've been that. He said, here, tell me this. Do you fancy going to a meeting? And, and, and then he said, how are you actually doing? And I was like, I just wanted to tell him. I, and I did. I, I, everything started to come out of me. I was talking to another alcoholic, properly. And I was like, I don't know. We were in a busy road. We are in, uh, in Oxbridge Road in London. And it's a busy, busy road. And I didn't see or hear traffic. All I can hear is myself telling this person. And he started looking at me and he put his hand on my shoulder and he said, do you want to go to a meeting? And I looked at him and I went, yeah. He said, I'll meet you this evening. Because he knew, he knew where, I, where, I, where I lived. He said, I'll meet you. You said your 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 home. He said, "We'll walk down to the meeting," and I said, "Right." He wasn't fifty yards down the road, and I'm going. Why did I say that? Why did I say that? I shouldn't have said that. I shouldn't have committed. This is the insanity of this disease. I mean, three weeks earlier, I've tried to commit suicide. Three weeks later, I've got someone standing in front of me asking me if they want to go to a meeting, and I've said yes, and now I'm thinking, why did I say that? What is this disease? You know, this is a powerful illness. Fair play to him, bang on, he's waiting outside. I went to the meeting. I went in that room that night, and I hadn't been for, for, for the best part of maybe 18 months. I'd, I was telling lies about going to a meeting to my wife. I was telling lies to everybody about, you know, and that, you know, you know, I'm not going to get into it, but it's it's total insanity. And I went into the meeting, and the first thing is, you know, three people come up to me. How are you doing? How are you? Good to see you. Are you okay? Have you dry? I'm no, I'm not. You know, I'm okay. And it was like the hands of Alcoholics Anonymous were just put round me, and that was the day I surrendered. No more contempt prior to investigation because I was now prepared to investigate every part of this program so that I could become like you, everyone who's in this pro who's doing this program. I wanted what you had, and I was willing to go to any lengths. 
any lengths. There was no issues anymore because a, a very nice black guy who was blind and he was uh, from Scotland and he was also obviously an alcoholic and his, his name was Charlie. And Charlie was the funniest character I've ever met because every time he's seen me or met me, he would say to me, nice to see you, Richard. Remember, surrender to win. And I'd go, Charlie, how can that happen? How can you win when you surrender? He said, you'll soon learn it. You'll get it. And, of course, that was the first time I, instantly I surrendered to all, uh, any contempt, anything that wasn't right, anything at all. That was it. Flat bottom. I started to change. And that's my journey from that point to, 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 to this day has been, like all of us, life has got in amongst it like you know i have to take life in life's terms you know i was you know i i've enjoyed life i've you know conventions uh a lot of my peer group obviously in 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 this fellowship have passed passed on sober but they've passed out of my life but their spirit lives within me you know i'm one of a group of five of us that, that used to go to conventions and there's I, you know there's i know there's only two of us left you know um and and that's sort of you know I, it, it reminds me that I've had a life beyond my wildest dreams because I'm at the, the that end of my life. You know, I, I my daughter who's joined the fellowship is at the beginning of her 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 her, her journey. I'm 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 towards I don't know, I'm I'm I don't you know, I'm 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 living today a day at a time the same as I've always done. I don't you never know what's around the corner, what's new, what's gonna happen, what the day'll bring anything like that. So, you know, it, it is a, pro, a procedure uh, that uh, I've kept very simple, you know. Um, you know, this is, this is uh, uh, you know, this illness manifests itself in all sorts of ways. Um, and in recovery, uh, you know, life uh, and acceptance, which is one of the key things, you know, in recovery, and it has been for me, uh, and that brings me back contempt prior to investigation because acceptance can only come from knowing the facts, you know, not, you know, sticking to the black bits in the big book and not reading the white bits is, was advised to me. And, and, and that stuck with me forever. You know, don't make it up in between the lanes. So a situation in life, whatever it is, you have to find out the facts, you know. I mean, I uh, became very ill in sobriety, you know. And, of course, when I was first they went to see the doctor and they told me I've got some really bad news for you, that your, 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 your heart, you know, uh, just, well, you just feel, you just, um, well, it's, you've never been told that before. You have a serious illness, you know. And, but I have to find out what, that illness was and I had to understand it and I had to sort of get the facts because it stops all that panic. But most of all, I was able to share on a daily basis my life with Alcoholics Anonymous and it never fails. And just take me back to the beginning, I'll finish on this, meeting uh, another fellow today from this fellowship in the flesh, uh, who came to see us on his way to to to, to another part of the, into Spain? Is what AA has always been about about two alcoholics meeting, and from them two first two men who met, this program became what it is today. And when two alcoholics meet, something happens, and I don't care how you define it, but something definitely happens, and it always that's how it works. We come to meetings and we share experience, strength and hope and we do service and we become what is our primary purpose is to stay sober and help all our alcoholics to achieve sobriety. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.